All right, I'm Matt Gottschall. This is a drug. Jake D'Onofrio, Gordy Stein, and my, Andrew Kling. And we're team two. And welcome to Android App Programming 101. All right, so we're going to go over the four Ds of app programming. I'm going to cover the things you need to download. And Jake's going to go over developing the application. Gordy's going to cover debugging the application, what tools you have for doing that. And Andrew's going to talk about distributing it onto the Android market, maybe making some money. All right, so here's a list of the software that's useful. It's all free. Um, you get it all from the Android developer website there. They have all sorts of tutorials and descriptions on where to go and what to get. Um, you need the software development kit, which has all the uh, libraries and interfaces that you need. The Eclipse uh, development environment is recommended. Um, and then you need this plugin for Eclipse that will incorporate the Android code into Eclipse. And anytime you're programming Java, you need the Java development kit to compile the Java code. So obviously we're going to be working in Java. Um, you can program in C++. For some applications, it's kind of limited functionality. I recommend using it for CPU intensive programs like um, signal processing and stuff, but it makes things overly complicated, so they usually just stick with Java. So Eclipse is recommended for your development environment because it's a Java program. It's written specifically for Java. It has nice autocomplete features and it can fix some errors for you automatically. Um, and then for Android specific things, you need the software development kit and the plugin for Eclipse that incorporates the development kit into Eclipse so that you can access the libraries and the, there's lots of programming interfaces to make things easier. Uh, all your layouts and uh, set of options for your application are in XML files and instead of having to manually edit them, they have <coughs> nice user interfaces. Which is especially nice for creating your own user interface for the actual application because you can see what it looks like and, and it shows you the widgets that are available and you can just drag and drop your buttons or text views or whatever you want and it'll generate the XML file for you and it gives you all the options that are available for you so you don't have to memorize them or look them up every time. Okay, so <coughs> when developing an application, we have a few uh, bullets that we want to touch on first. Um, starting with Android, we know there's quite a few versions of the operating system out there. It's part of their fragmentation issue that they're dealing with. But as you can see, we have versions from 1.6 all the way to 2.3, which are all out in production right now. And uh, each operating system version, they're all backwards compatible with the previous ones. So if you decide, when you make an app, you choose which, what's the lowest level you want to work on. So if you program for 2.2, 2.1 will not be able to run the app, however 2.3 will. Um, the next issue you want you to look at is hardware. Different phones have different hardware inside, different processors, different sensors. Um, so when making your app, you're also going to need to check to make sure whoever downloads this app has that sensor first before trying to run the app or you're going to run into some issues. Uh, another thing to look at is also your audience. Um, Typically, you, I mean, if you want a wide distribution of your app, you want people to use it, you don't want to program for more than just your target audience. It's kind of an issue that we have to deal with on the iDosin team, too. Um, we try to open it up to more than just the uh, uh, disabilities. Um, and like I said, we cover on the next slide. Okay, so when you run an app, uh, it goes through this kind of state graph here. So whenever you click on it, the activity starts, your app is, it starts off as an activity, it's what it's, it's run as. Uh, it starts on, on, on create. That's the first function that's run, it starts here at the top. And basically here is where you're gonna wanna create all your variables. Uh, anything that's static, anything that needs to be um, ready for the app to run. Uh, after on create is finished, it's gonna call on start, which is the next function down. On start is simply where you, it's, it's called right before your app is actually displayed on your phone. So you want to start setting up your UI, your text views, any views that you need. You want them created, you want them uh, set up. After your on start is finished, it's going to call on resume. So it's going to keep going down the line. On resume is actually, it, 
put your application in the in the start uh, running state, sorry, and uh, you're going to want to uh, um, basically this is this is your application running right now. So anything that changes is going to be implemented here. Um, so at this point, your your application is running. If you hit your home button on your phone, it's going to put it in the background, and you're actually going to call on pause. So your application is still running on your phone. It gets the pause state. And this is where you want to save the state, save any static variables, save any settings that your application is holding on to for when it starts again, <coughs> or if you're just going to close it. Uh, after on pause is called, uh, your application is no longer visible. It's now at your home screen, or it's at a different app, depending on what you did. And on stop is called. On stop is anything that your CPU on your phone is doing needs to be stopped here, otherwise you're just wasting your battery power. So any sensors need to be turned off, anything that you're currently using. Uh, and from here, if you programmed it to um, just be destroyed at that point, this is where this is going to get called. Either that or it's going to go back around and hit on restart and your application come back to the front view of your phone. Um, that's it. Okay, so we're going to go through creating a basic hello world uh, application. It's the typical uh, starting starting point for any kind of programming language. But um, you can see here, this is Eclipse. We have a couple screenshots. Uh, when you create a new Android program, this is what I was talking about for different APIs. You choose the different um, different levels that you want. Um, so this one, we have 2.2 selected. And I just did uh, Hello World. All right. So the application name, obviously, is pretty straightforward. And the package name is, is kind, of a, it's kind of a Java thing. It's how Java references all of its classes. Everything that's in your current project is going to be in that current package. But if you want to reuse code from before, you can actually add this package to your class path for Java when it compiles. And you can reference it using jacob.helloworld. whatever your class is, and you can reuse your code from before. Um, and then the create activity is actually your the name of your app. So since it's Hello World, I just call it Hello World, and that's my activity. Okay. So uh, here's the Hello World app. You can tell I added a total of three lines of code. Um, this is exactly what it looks like. It's going to be a black screen, which is just your standard text view with text at the top. <coughs> uh, in order to do this, um, I created our text view, which is one of the many views that you can choose from. If you want to draw OpenGL graphics, 2D or 3D, it has its own view. If you want to draw pictures, you have a picture view. Um, and since I'm just using text, I have a text view. But as you can tell here, I just create the view, and I uh, set the text, and then I set it to display. And that's all you have to do. OK, um, we're going to go through a simple sensor example. So it's not exactly that complicated. Um, but just to start, um, you need to make your application. Uh, Java is very um, object oriented, so what we need to do is we need to uh, um, implement the interface for the sensors. So every time you're uh, your sensors um, change, they, you want to be able to call certain functions in your application. So that you have to implement the sensor event listener first. And then you also want to set up a sensor manager, which gives your application access to even use the sensors, which is being done right here. And so we just grab the system service for sensors, and then <coughs> we have our sensor manager. And then as I got the last bullet down here, fill in overridden sensors. Whenever you implement either an abstract class or an interface. Along with that <laughs> comes with certain classes that you, or certain functions that you need to define. So that's what we're going to do on the next slide. So the next slide, we get, we have on resume here. This is actually part of the state graph, but as you can tell as we go through different states, on resume is where we actually want to set up our sensor. So when our application restarts, we need to reset up our sensor, or if it's just starting, we need to set up our sensor as well. So. As we see, we're using an accelerometer, and we're also going to use a normal delay. The delay is just how often you want the sensor to give you information. Always, it's going to be very fast, and it's going to uh, cause your application to crash. Um, the next, all right, we have two more functions. This co comes with all the sensors. We have um, on accuracy change and on sensor change. So each um, sensor has both an accuracy and data. So. Um, typically, you don't have to worry about the accuracy, but since we're using the accelerometer, the accuracy always stays as um, un unreliable, which is the worst state, because the accelerometer just doesn't get any better than that, I guess. 
Um, but whenever that changes, if it does, that, that function is going to be called. And that's where you can deal with whatever necessary changes you need to make for your application. And then also, whenever your data is changed, on sensor change is going to be called, which is going to have the sensor event. And you can reference that, and it has your um, data for the X, Y, and Z um, coordinates. That's how the accelerometer is going to work. And you can pull the <coughs> doubles out of there, and you can display them or do whatever you want with them. And uh, the last, I kind of skipped over this, is on pause. But when your application, you hit the home button, you want to turn off the sensor so you're saving your battery power or whatever. And that way it's not constantly still running in the background. So on pause, we're just going to unregister our listener. OK, and this last part we're going to do is making a menu. So on your Android phone, they all have a menu button. And if you're on your browser, you hit it, a little menu will pop up. Well, this is all that the, it really does. So Matt was talking about XML, XML files that were um, used to make certain GUI pieces. This is a certain, this is a really simple menu. Um, actually, I pulled this right from the Android website. It's, uh, well, it's we have uh, XML, we have in the menu bracket, which just defines the menu so it knows what it is. And then inside, we have two buttons. So we have a new game button and a help button. And if you use Eclipse, it will actually do a lot of this for you. You don't even have to memorize these because it's pretty much autocomplete. You just type the first letter and you have all your options right there. But that's a simple menu. And then uh, next we need to inflate the menu. What I mean by that is XML code isn't exactly executable. So what we need to do is when we inflate it, we actually make it executable. We translate it into runnable code, basically. So um, your application can override uh, the onCreate options menu. And that is run once when your uh, application is executed. And it will inflate your menu, which gives, lets it <coughs> pop up. Looks like. And the last thing is since we have two buttons, we obviously want the application to do something when we touch them. So on options, on options I'm selected is executed whenever that happens. And then each button has its own ID that you define in the XML. And you can reference it right here. And so now you know which button you're pushing, and you can uh, call the appropriate function that you define or have to do all this work right there, depending on how you want to do it. I think that's it. I hand it over to Gordy.